God's Empathy When we are overwhelmed with our weaknesses, we are to seek God's help, being assured that God empathizes with our humanness and desires to help us. Here's Gene to explain. See, God knew Saul's weaknesses, and he was empathetic to those weaknesses. Even though he appeared to be strong, head and shoulders above everybody, Saul was a weak man in many respects. Now, God knew he needed reassurance. If you go to um, uh, chapter 9, and let's look at uh, verse 21. When, when Samuel, uh, Samuel through God's Word, prophesied that he was going to be the king. Here how, here's how Saul responded. Am I not a Benjamite from the smallest of Israel's tribes? And isn't my clan the least important of all the clans of the Benjamite tribe? So why have you said something like this to me? Now God knew that he needed reassurance. That this was true. That he had really called him. That, that Saul was really God's choice, even though uh, they had asked for a king with the wrong motives. So, here's what God did. And it's really fascinating because you, ca you can call this uh, a series of miracles to demonstrate to Saul that God had chosen him in this particular situation. Let's look at that in uh, the next few verses. Uh, in chapter 10, Samuel took the flask of oil, poured it out on Saul's head, kissed him and said, Hasn't the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? And I want to prove this to you. God's going to prove this to you. Today, when you leave me, you'll find two men at Rachel's grave at Zilzah in the land of Benjamin. Now, what's significant about seeing two men? At this point, we see the law of probability at work. As you read through the passage, let's read on. And you'll see the significance of that. You will proceed from there until you come to the oak of Tabor. Three men, three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there. One bringing three goats. One bringing three loaves of bread. One bringing a skin of wine. Now think about that. We read on. They will ask how you are and give you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will come to the hill of God where there are Philistine garrisons. Now, here's the question. According to the law of probability, what are the chances that meet two men, three men, three loaves, three goats? Two of them will do this. I haven't figured that out because I'm not a mathematician. But the probability there is beyond possibility that that would happen. And it all happened in a single day. What is God doing? He's reassuring Saul in his weakness that he is indeed God's choice. And so we see this, this reassurance. We see God's empathy. And aren't you glad God is empathetic? to all of us, to each one of us, as His servants, even some of His greatest servants. For example, we see this, I think, in, in Peter's life. You go to uh, the New Testament, Luke, uh, Luke chapter 22. Uh, Simon, Simon, this is Peter. Look out, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And, and we might add that one of the reasons that Satan was going to try to sift Peter as wheat is he knew his weaknesses. He knew where to hit him. He knew his areas of vulnerability. But here are the reassuring words. Jesus said, But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Now Peter was faithless, but ultimately he returned. And you, when you have turned back from your faithlessness, uh, strengthen your brothers, and you will turn back. That's what he was saying. And obviously, all of this happened to Peter. Satan tried to sift him like wheat, and he failed. 
Died the Lord three times. But when he saw his failure, he wept, he repented, he turned back, and then God used him to strengthen the other apostles and also to launch the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus had prayed for him. And the exciting thing is that Jesus prays for us too. God is concerned about us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our failures. Uh, and that's why Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 are so meaningful. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. I use the word empathy. Uh, those two words are very close. To empathize, to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. And this, of course, is something beyond our comprehension. Jesus was indeed God, but He was a God-man. And in His humanness, He was tempted in every way that we are. That I cannot even conceive of. Because think of all the temptations that human beings face. And yet Jesus can identify with those. The pain that He went through in temptation, and yet without sin. And therefore, the author of Hebrews goes on in chapter 4. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. Isn't that a wonderful, reassuring thing to realize that God is empathetic towards us. He sympathizes with our weaknesses, even as believers. And we can approach Him. He knows us. He knows our weaknesses, just like He knew Saul's weaknesses. And He knows our weaknesses in the past, today, and in the future. And He's our great High Priest, through whom which we can approach God and seek for grace and mercy. And so the question for reflection and response is beyond His intercessory ministry in heaven. In what ways does God empathize with our weaknesses and encourage us? Well, uh, what we read in Philippians chapter 4 is really an extension of His high priestly work. But it's the result of His high priestly work and His prayers for us, but at the same time our prayers that we can take to the Father through Jesus. And I love this passage. I refer to it often and try to practice it often because I need the reassurance and the result of this, this prayer in my own life. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition. And who is there at the right hand of the Father? Listening to us? Representing us to the Father? It's our great High Priest. And with boldness we can come. And that's why Paul elaborates, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasseth every thought will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that's a promise personally, but that's also a promise corporately. Because where two or three are gathered, Jesus said, there I am. Does that mean He's not with us all the time? He's with us all the time. But in some unique way, when we gather together, when we lift our hearts in prayer, when we join our hearts in prayer with one mind and one heart and pray and seek Him, He gives us peace. Not just individually, but collectively. And so, you see, Paul is writing to the Philippians who were persecuted. He was writing to Christians who he encouraged to pray together to seek God's grace and to seek God's help. So prayer through the great high priest, Jesus, is not just our individual prayers, but it's our corporate prayers as we agree together and we pray for one another. And that's why there's such an emphasis throughout the New Testament on corporate prayer, praying for one another. So that's a vertical application, I think, of, of this concept. But there's also the horizontal, which I've already uh, alluded to, and we see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. We can call this horizontal. Therefore, encourage one another, and build each other up, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, as you are already doing. And this is one of the great ways in which we can experience God's help as He works through the body of Christ as we practice this beautiful one another, that is to encourage one another. Uh, and we need that. 
We need that. And there are many ways in which we can encourage one another. And the scriptures speak to that rather graphically.